So there's a statement here in Philippians chapter 2 that the Apostle Paul makes as he's writing to the, uh, to the Philippians, to these Christians in the town of Philippi. And he, he uses something that we see a number of places throughout the Bible that uses the word light or shining forth as lights. He shows this in contrast to the world that we live in and the people that make choices that are not based upon God and His Word. And it's certainly true that we should be different. It's certainly true that we don't need to be conformed to this world, but rather be transformed and follow the will of God. But it is also true that if we're going to be lights, it's going to affect our lives in different ways. So I want, to, I want to look at some things as we think about the idea of shining our light of what's said by Jesus in His Sermon on the Mount. This is a, this phrase that's usually used of this sermon in Matthew chapter 5 that goes from chapter 5 all the way through chapter 7. And it is a great sermon. It is one that I personally have never been able to fit into one sermon. <laughs> the 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 depth of it, the beauty of it. Um, I don't even know how many sermons I've preached from the Sermon on the Mount because there is so much to it. There's so much value in the words of Christ as he's preaching here on this occasion. If, you're gonna, if you'd like to follow along with us in the reading, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 5 beginning in verse 14. And he uses a couple of different illustrations to talk about the way that we should influence one another. In fact, if we back up just to verse 12, he uses the idea of salt. He says, you're the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled under, underfoot by men. And he describes, of course, the value of salt is the flavor it gives. We don't put salt on food because we want to raise our blood pressure. Right? We put salt on the food because we like the way it tastes and it enhances the flavor. Imagine putting salt, you find some salt and it has no flavor to it and you're still putting it on your food. <laughs> um, it wouldn't make any sense. And he's describing us as being like that. If we don't, if we don't have some saltiness, if we don't have some, some flavor, the flavor that's influenced by Christ, then we're not really of being of any benefit to the ones around us. But but he uses, and this is maybe a more well-known illustration of what we're to be, the same thing that is mentioned to the Philippians in, there in chapter 4 and verse 15, and that is that we are to be lights. So when he says, you are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, that concept of being the light of the world, that we're to be, we think about the way that we use light in our homes. You know, he uses that illustration and he says, you know, you don't, uh, you don't, put your, you don't light a light. Of course, we, we have a switch we turn on, but in their day they had to light either an oil lamp or a candle, some way to make this light shine, and then they wouldn't just then cover it up. Be like going in and turning on the light in the room and then and then covering it up with a a blanket or something, you know, on a, all over the lamp. Why would you do that? You know? And then stumble around because you can't see. Um we also see that we think about the way that is, is what he's talking about, is that there's obviously a need for Christians to be an influence on other people, for us to do what we can to reach other people with the message. And it's not just in words. It's not just in the things we say, but it's also in the things that we do. Notice in the very next verse, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. That is, it should be demonstrated in the things we do. The way we treat people. The conduct of our lives. So I want to actually you notice a number of things that we'll see as it relates to shining our light. If one of the things that's mentioned in that verse and something that's elaborated on in the next part of the Sermon on the Mount is godly conduct. Is the conduct that we have. It's not about showing off and trying to impress people, but it is about realizing as we put things into practice, it's going to have an influence on the people around us. But it is also affected by 
the kind of attitude that we have about it. To have a joyful attitude is something that's going to shine a light better than being Mr. Grumpy, right? If all we are, okay, we're doing some things we should do and we're trying to follow, but we're just as miserable about it and we let everybody else know about how miserable we are about it, it's not going to be very attractive to people that they're going to know what's making us tick and what it is that's driving us in that way. It is also important that we really care about people, that we genuinely are interested in the well-being of others. And we're going to notice a number of things this is really what we're going to just talk about this morning are those three things. So we think about the idea of godly conduct. I want you to notice there, if you're still in Matthew chapter 5, I want you to just notice some of the things that he talks about. And I'm not going to go into detail about all of these things, but I just want to notice the wide range of things that he's talking about that have to do with not just a superficial meeting some kind of a requirement as much as it becoming part of our heart and our, and our drive. You know, you think about just, and you're, if you're familiar with Matthew chapter 5, if you're familiar with the things that, that, are, that Jesus writes about, He delves deeper into things than just somebody trying to meet, you know, the basic conditions of things. And especially in regard to their own think-sos many times. And just, I'm going to read this statement first of all, because it's intended by Jesus to get our attention. It's in verse 20 of Matthew chapter 5. And he mentions the Pharisees. The Pharisees were known for the strict adherence to their traditions, right? I mean, they had, they took the law of Moses and they added all their traditions and all of their think so's. And they were so meticulous about everything. In fact, later on in Matthew chapter 23, he talks about them being so meticulous about their tithing that they would go out into their spice gardens and they would try to figure out. I'm, I'm picturing with a measuring stick. Okay, how much did this uh, mint plant grow? How much did I gain? Now, I've got to take 10%. How many leaves is that? You know, <laughs> Or the rosemary or the thyme or whatever spices. They, they, were, they were very meticulous. And he wasn't necessarily criticizing them about that, but he said they left undone the weightier matters of the law. But to the people of that day, the Pharisees were like the most strict people there were. And, and they equated that with spirituality. They, they, they were certainly very meticulous. They were very religious about their observances. But where was their heart in it? And by meeting these requirements they had placed, they often left undone what God wanted them to do. Notice there in verse 20, he says, I say unto you, and I say this is a shocking statement because they knew how strict the Pharisees were. He says, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. But as he elaborates on that, he says things that relate to the conduct of, a, of our lives, the way we treat other people. For example, in verse 21, you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. Whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Who says to his brother, Rekha, which is a, a word of contempt, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says you fool will be in danger of hell fire. You know, he's letting them know you don't, you don't just need to worry about the matter of killing. So I can go up to the point of killing them as long as I don't kill them. I can hate them and hope they die. But I'm not going to go to that point. He goes on and he says in verse 27, You've heard it was said to those of you, you shall not commit adultery. As long as I don't go to that point. But what does he say right after that? He says, I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. In verse 33, he says, Again, you've heard it was said to of old, you shall not swear falsely, but you shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, you do not swear at all, neither by heaven, nor for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the God. Of God. And so he says... You know, you don't just go to the point of this. And the, the principle of swearing, and when he describes the matter of letting your yea be yea and your no, no in verse, 30, verse uh, 37, he's saying your word needs to be sincere whether you make, you know, some, uh, I always think about this, okay? 
This, is, this goes back to my grammar school days, okay? That, you know, there were guys that could say all kinds of stuff. And maybe what they were saying is true or maybe it wasn't. But if they said, I swear on my mother's grave, then you could believe what they were saying. But what about the other time? Well, then you didn't know. It was not... It should be that we're honest, no matter what the cost is, no matter what may happen as a result of it, that we're going to tell the truth, that we are people that keep our word. In verse 38, he says, You've heard it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants you to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. Whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. We use that phrase today, going the extra mile. And from what I understand, there was a compelling thing that would happen by the Romans who were ruling them. They, they would, they, they had to, they had to carry, carry this man's burden for a mile. He said, go, you, Take, go the extra mile. You ever use that phrase? Maybe you're talking about somebody else. Hey, this person really went the extra mile. They did more than what I deserve. They were doing more than what was actually required. They're going beyond what might be expected. Verse 43, you've heard it said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say you love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Now, you think about these things that he's talking about that relate to the way that you're treating other people, the way you're interacting with other people. And realizing that in the process, we're letting our light shine when we're choosing God's way. When we're letting Him shine through us, we have an, we have an opportunity in that way to do many things. So you see a number of things that are said throughout the Bible that indicate our need to realize that decisions we make about the way we live have a profound impact on the people around us. And, and you can think about that maybe in the negative and see that sometimes when people are saying that they're following Christ and their life certainly doesn't dictate it, that it has a very negative effect on their ability to ever reach them with anything regarding the message of the gospel. 1 Peter 2 and verse 11, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that while they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. I think there's another important thing here, and that is that when we're talking about living right and doing right, that we don't leave it as just somebody Glorifying ourselves. Maybe even to find ways to make comments and say, you know, this isn't the way I'd be if it wasn't for Christ. I just want to let Him shine through me and influence the things I'm saying. I'd be a far different person. I wouldn't be acting this way if it's up to just me. It's only because of Him and His will. And his word and his direction. And it should be honoring God and not, not ourselves. You know, that's another thing about the Pharisees. In fact, if we want to keep going with the summarizing, I, as I said, I don't think I can get all of the Sermon on the Mount in one sermon if I really went into detail. But you think about the very next chapter in chapter 6. He's talking about people who are doing good things, but for the wrong reason. Praying, giving, fasting, and they're doing it because they want to impress people. I'm not talking about when we say let our light shine, let's impress people with just how good we are. It is impressing people with how good God's way is and how good God is. You know, and, and of course we think about bad conduct that often is the reason why people say, well, I don't want anything to do with Christianity. I know, I know people that claim to be Christians and they're, they're just big hypocrites. They don't really believe what they're doing. They, they're, they, live one, they say one thing, they do another. And often they don't want to hear what you have to say about God if that's what they see in your life. In fact, they might even blame God for your conduct. I've, I've had many people that blame God for bad things that so-called Christians do. 
And maybe even sometimes real Christians do. What I mean is, those kinds of bad influences and those things that happen are really difficult for overcome, to overcome. It may be because somebody lets themselves get upset about things and act in ungodly ways and things they say and things they do. And I'm not saying that they can't be forgiven and I'm not saying that they can't be right with God, but maybe that influence that they've lost there because they acted that way at any given time. And, and let's not just think about, okay, yeah, I can be forgiven. I'll, I'll repent and I'll ask God to forgive me and I can stand right with God. I'm talking about the influence on other people when we're the one that they know of that's supposed to be a Christian and realize that in some cases, you may be the primary one that one knows, maybe the only one that they know <laughs> that's really a Christian. And so what does your influence say? If it's, if it's not really the kind of conduct and the way we treat people, the way we talk, and not just on short-term basis, I can, t- I can do this for just a little bit, don't ask me to do it for my whole life. Why not? It's really, it's really the way we should be. It's really what choices we should make to trust God and His ways. And it should be the attitude that we have in the midst of. It is not begrudgingly... Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to treat people right. I'm gonna try to be kind to people, but I, you know, I kind of resent it. I'd rather just tell them what I really think. That's really being honest, right? Just say whatever's on your mind. <laughs> you know, sometimes having the discretion to not say what is on our mind really is the best thing to do. And especially as it relates to the effect that we can have on others. I mean, you think about the early Christians. They were, they were people that not, they, they not only had the desire to follow Christ and the, and the desire to trust Him and listen to what He had to say. They were so glad that it was contagious. And you see it in the very first beginning of the church in Acts chapter 2 and verse 46 when it says, So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. It was contagious. Because it was obvious they were happy to serve the Lord. They were so thrilled about the message of the gospel. Of being a part of that. We also see what happened even when they were facing persecution. As the Sanhedrin council, the council of 70. The ones that were responsible for the death of Jesus. And eventually for the death of Stephen in chapter 7. They are threatening and beating the apostles. Why? Because the apostles were... Causing riots? Because the apostles were destroying property? Because the apostles were stealing things? Because the apostles were injuring people? None of that. They were beating them and they were throwing them in prison because they were teaching the truth about the gospel of Christ. And they were being effective In fact, one of the statements that the Sanhedrin made to the apostles is said, you have filled Jerusalem with this teaching. In their case, they're thinking this is an accusation. I think it was a great compliment to them, wasn't it? Say, you filled Jerusalem with with the teaching about Christ. So they're beaten, literally beaten. And it says they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for His name. They, they, were, they were rejoicing about this. How could they do that? Uh, that had to also have an effect on the people of that day, and it can have an effect on us as well as we just think about this, the truth of it, the sincerity of it, the reality of the salvation that is in Christ was something that did not, was not shaken by the persecution that was coming from these others. And we may not face that kind of persecution, but sometimes we just have somebody go, boo! And now we're scared to speak up. 
What I mean is somebody starts disparaging something we're saying. They start maybe saying something against us. And we get scared about it. They don't speak up like we need to. And it should be that, that we are rejoicing about this. It says that this, the next verse goes on and says, And daily in the temple and at every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. They got beaten for it and they're still doing it. Because they knew, as Peter said when they questioned him about it, we must obey God rather than man. That's more important. And it should be in every aspect that we think about doing what God wants us to do and not what men are telling us to do, whether that's one person, whether that's a government, whether that's a society, whether it's a culture. That we do what God wants us to do. And as such, we also need to be ready to answer. You see that in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. People see your conduct. They see the attitude you have. Hey, what? What is with you? Why are you like that? How come you're not doing what everybody else is doing? How come you don't talk the way other people talk? In the words you use and the things you talk about. How come you don't react the way other people react when things would normally get people upset and they would turn and attack other people and you don't do that? Well, it's because I'm just so good. You know? No, I think this is also those things that have to do with opportunities. To say, this is the Lord's way. I trust the Lord's way. It really is best. And it is God who's helping me to be this way. And you can be too, because it really has to do with where you stand with God. Notice in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, he says, Sanctify the Lord. I, I, I actually think it's... The, the, when you look at the textual things, there is an older text that says this, sanctify Christ as Lord. Instead of the Lord God, it says, sanctify Christ as Lord. And whether that's the case, or whether we're saying just sanctify the Lord in your hearts, this, this wording here is saying you need to sanctify the Lord. What? How do you sanctify the Lord? He's already sanctified. He is set apart. He is not part of the world. He's not talking about sanctifying Him in the sense of his position. He's talking about sanctifying where he is in position in your heart. Notice that in your hearts. Where do you place God in priority? Where do you place Christ as the Lord in your life? We have other people that we may be under the authority of. We're under the authority of the government. We're under the authority of a boss. We're under the authority of, you know, we're, we think about being in a home, whether it's a wife's submission to her husband or their children submitting to their parents, or maybe somebody in a, in a classroom submitting to the teacher. We have these people that we accept in positions of authority that relate to the the relationships we're in and, and circumstances we're in. And we have, of course, our own thinking that maybe is not necessarily submitting as we should, but all of which needs to be in submission to Christ and who He is. We say He's the King. We say He's the Lord. Are those just words? We're just saying He's the Lord? Or are we saying, no, I'm accepting His headship, His rule in my life. And that's, a, some, that's something each of us have to answer ourselves. I just want to be the boss of me. There was a little kid one time that was being reprimanded about listening to what somebody was saying. And this kid said, we the boss of ourselves. <laughs> and sometimes adults think in the same way. I don't want anybody telling me what to do, and that sometimes is toward God. We sanctify Christ as Lord, meaning that we are accepting His authority in our life. When He said, all authority is given me in heaven on earth in the Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18, he was describing, he was letting us know he's the one we need to listen to. He's the one that we need to submit to. We need to accept that not only that he has the right to tell us what we should and should not do, 
But a trust that what he's telling us is really the best thing for us. The phrase that's in James chapter 1 verse 21 which says, Receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. I was reading about that word meekness, trying to distinguish it from humility. Humility has to do with the way we view ourselves and not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought. Meekness has to do with the way we view God and His treatment of us, which means also His Word that He's directed at us. How do we view that? Do we view it as just, well, it's what I have to do? Or do we say, no, I recognize that His dealings with us are always right and good. And what He requires of us is the best. Instead of always questioning whether we really want to follow that or not, we should be ready to in that way. But, but this verse is really goes on beyond that in saying, now that we, we, we sanctify Christ as Lord in our hearts, we put Him in first place, and He says, always be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, yet with meekness and fear. That, that description of saying that we set Him as first, we set Him as Lord, we set Him apart, that's what sanctify means, to set apart. I'm going to set Him apart. He is the Lord. He's the Master. So should we, should we try to talk to people about Christ when they're asking about some of those things they see different in us? Or see the commitment that's involved in making a regular habit of being with Christians and assemblies like this? Are those things that we, we should talk about Him? Is there any question? Is there any question that should be what we're what our answer is about is about Him and about His Word and about His will for us. And when He says being ready to answer or being ready to give a defense, that also implies, of course, the beginning point of the sanctification of the heart, ready to defend what we're saying and to do so with meekness and fear. That is, those are the words that He uses there, that it is with meekness. Not weakness. It's not weakness. It's meekness. That does have to do with this trust in God and His will for us. And when we think about being ready, that means also, I mean, it's obviously an attitude. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to do this, but it's also about being prepared. That should be a goal of every Christian. Your, your goal should not just be about listening things for own, your own introspection and your own application in your life, but also to think about ways you can help other people. Learn about the gospel. Learn about their salvation. Learn about God's way. And that preparation is something that is, doesn't just come automatically. It's something that requires the effort to do that. And, and let me make a suggestion for you. Along that line, listen. Listen to things that other Christians have to say. And I don't mean just the preacher. I mean... When you have conversations with others, find out how they answer things, how they approach people. And some people, when you find somebody that's really effective in reaching other people with the word, listen closer. <laughs> well, what is it? How, how do they say this? What is a way that this is presented? How do they, how do they get past some of the barriers that, that naturally come up as people are hearing this? that they're able to then deal with those things. But it also, when we think about being ready to answer, it also means we have a willingness to. That we're willing to do this. And, and then what we can do to be able to do that, that also has to do with listening well and, and preparing and studying for ways that we can answer. Because look, <laughs> I'm saying this, and sometimes our, ten, our tendency is to say, well, maybe, maybe I can. Maybe. This is important. This is crucial to what we're here for. I mean, what good is our life if we're not being a, a light and to have salt? Remember what Jesus said. <laughs> if the law, salt has lost its flavor or its savor, it's not good for anything. What, what's our value in being here? I, I, I recognize that when we think about the gospel and we think about the promises that God has and we think about the promise, the hope that we have in Christ... 
It is, as Paul describes in Philippians 1, very far better to depart and be with the Lord. But why did he say his reason was for remaining in this life? He said it's for the sake of other people and the furtherance of the gospel. And that then is, emanates from his care for people. He cared about people. And that's something that we need to have as well. In for Romans 12 and verse 9, it says, Let love be without hypocrisy. I, I, I pondered that for a while. I thought, what, what's hypocritical love? What is hypocritical love? Hypocritical love would certainly include pretending, which, because you know that's the idea of hypocrisy. Uh, the, the hypocrite... Did you know that the word hypocrite, the, the hypocrites in the Greek, was a word that was used of stage actors? They're playing a part. You know, you watch some show, and you see this actor who's playing a part, and we realize that's not really his or her personality or her reaction. It's not her story, his story. They're playing, they're playing a part. And sometimes we're very shocked when we find out what the person's really like. <laughs> you know, if you get an interview and you go, wow, he's very different than the parts he plays. You know? Which is what their job is. But what if it's somebody's life? And they're playing the part of a Christian. But they're really not. And in regard to love, we say this is pretending to love and not really loving. It's one thing to say we love somebody. It's even one thing to act like we love. But to really care about them, to really care about their well-being, incorporates not only things we say that maybe are encouraging and stuff like that, but also that we address things that need to be corrected. Somebody's not a Christian. Do we just make them feel good about not being a Christian? And about not following Christ, about not obeying the gospel, we just make them feel good because we love them. We want to be good. We want to have a good relationship with them. Or do we tell them what they need to hear? It may not be necessarily easy. I think that relates to the last part of that verse abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. Encourage what is good, but address the things that are wrong, that are evil. Matthew 5 and verse 43, we read it a moment ago. You've heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even tax collectors do the same. And if you greet brethren only, what do you do more than the others? Do not even the tax collectors do so. Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. And we look at that verse and we go, I'm never going to be perfect, so I'm not going to worry about it. What he's, what's he telling us here? He's saying, you need to be like your Father in this. Complete in regard to love. That you're caring about people, all people. And I'm going to say it this way. Whether you like them or not. You need to love them. Whether you like them or not. They may not have a personality. They may not have a lifestyle. They may not have. There may be any number of things. That, that you're kind of not necessarily drawn to. Because of the way they are. But what you do need to care about them. Because God does. Jesus died that they might live. You think about the things that Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And he talks about people having... And I want you to notice in these first three verses of chapter 13, we talk about the love chapter. We read this in weddings and we talk about the, the characteristics of love. And that's all well and good because it certainly applies to every relationship. But he begins this as he's talking about things that are done for the... You, you think about why God gave these miraculous gifts of speaking with tongues and such as He starts off with here. 
But what was the purpose of it? It was to prove that the message was from God so that people would receive this message and that their souls would be saved. She says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. What is he saying? I'm just making a bunch of noise. When he says I don't have love, he's talking about the ones that are listening. Do I love them? He says, though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, love I'm nothing. Or have all this knowledge, all this, you know, we find people, we appreciate their knowledge of things, their wisdom about things. We listen to these philosophers, these motivational speakers, all kinds of people maybe we're listening to, and we just appreciate what they have and the message that they have. But he says, it's no good if it's not really that you care about people. Love. Love, love, love in its basic meaning, agape. Love is wanting the best for people. Want genuine concern for their well-being. You know, we can think about this in another sense. Okay, what if I knew the Bible backwards and forwards? I knew every verse. I could give you an explanation of anything, any question you ask me. But I don't care anything about the people that are listening. <laughs> when we're talking about our light shining, don't think that's not going to have an effect. When it becomes obvious, we don't really care about the people that we're talking to. I just want to tell you what I know. I want to show you how smart I am. I think that's more repelling than it is attracting people to the message. Even, even various deeds. He says, although I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, though I give my body to be burned. Boy, what a, talk about an extreme description of what somebody's willing to do. He said, but if I don't have love, it profits me nothing. And we think about uh, really how people react on the one hand when they perceive that there really is a great deal of concern that someone has. And I mean this in the sense of you talking to your friends and neighbors. You're not just about winning an argument. You're not just about trying to present something that you know to be true in the Bible. You really care about them. And, you know, Theodore Roosevelt made a statement. He said, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. I don't, I don't know the context of, I'll ask one of you history buffs about, what was the context that made him say that? I don't know. But it's an, it's an, it's, it's an important point to see that it will come across how much you care about someone or if you're just wanting to win an argument. So we'll close with asking this, is your light shining? And as we think about our own lives and our own influence that we can have on others, there's no question that God wants us to let our light shine. And it isn't that we're just alone in the world and have no effect on the people around us. You do... You affect people around you whether you realize it or not. The question is, is it the kind of influence that makes them want to know more about Christ? Or is it something that becomes a stumbling block to them in even learning what they need to learn? But I want to also remind you, if you're here this morning and you're not in Christ, if you're not a Christian, you can't let his light shine. You need to be a Christian. Maybe you're here and you've been thinking about obeying the gospel. And thinking about following him. And this is an opportunity for you. We don't know how many opportunities we're going to get. We don't know how much longer time on earth will last. And none of us know how long our own lives will last. We hear about it all the time. We know about people that were planning more things and their life ended. And I don't say that just as a matter of, you know, trying to scare you, but maybe I am. <laughs> maybe I do want to scare you a little bit. But I don't want you to I don't want you to think of that just as a matter of thinking about that fear, but also thinking about who God is and what He's done for you. He sent His Son to die that you might live. 
this great sacrifice demonstrates God's love for you. He wants you to be saved. He wants you to be with him. And he, he extends that invitation. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And you shall have rest unto your souls. And so this, this invitation is his invitation. But I hope you'll make use of this opportunity if we can help you in becoming a Christian. If you're willing to repent, change your mind about things that are in conflict with God. Confess your faith that He is the Son of God. Be baptized for the remission of your sins and raised to walk a new life. Or maybe you've done, begun that and you've let your light dim. You've been covering it up. And you want to take the bushel off. If we can help you in any way, come forward as we stand and as we sing.